Yay! Yay! What is up, everyone? First, I want to just test that our <laughs> mics are working and that you can hear us uh, because we are testing some new hardware and software this week, doing things a little bit different. And uh, I was just testing, was there music in that wait screen? I'm curious. Uh, so before we actually start the, the show show, I just kind of want to make sure that everyone can hear us. Can you hear us? <laughs> uh, I'll wait for some of the chat to jump in there. Um, but regardless, we're very excited. Okay. <laughs> Kim verified. You can, in fact, hear us. Great. Welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, episode 347. We're so excited about tonight's show uh, because we got David Roach. David Roach is back on the show. Coach Roach for another mm -hmm. Ask Coach Roach. So if you have any burning questions in regards to training, racing, uh, preparing for a big event or a DIY project that you maybe have in the works, these episodes are fantastic because we get to chat with one of our favorite humans on Earth, David Roach. We always leave these shows super inspired. He's a wonderful human. He's the Ted Lasso. No, he's Ted Lasso before Ted Lasso was Ted yes. Lasso. Yeah, he's the Ted Lasso original. is the David Roach of. I almost were you gonna say David Blaine? <laughs> no, <laughs> he's a little bit of both. Uh, regardless, we are so excited about tonight's show. Sit back, relax, everyone. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live. Three forty-seven. The show begins. Ginger Runner. Yay! What is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 347. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. Uh, we're still kind of working on some of the technical aspects of the show. We have a new computer that the GR crew has named Mixtreamy. So Which tonight, I think is a very fitting name. Totally. Uh, I think it works <laughs> quite well. And uh, tonight's sort of the first usage of Mixtreamy in Ginger Runner Live setting. So you might hear some audio in some places. You might not in others. I'm still getting everything sort of figured out, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of of being live. So welcome to the show. I'm very excited about tonight's episode because our guest tonight is the one and only David Roach, Coach David Roach. Uh, it's our ninth episode of our ongoing series with David called Ask Coach Roach, where we get to answer, well, he gets to answer all of your burning <laughs> questions in regards to training, racing, preparing for a big DIY event or any of that sort of thing. And just overall inspiration and preparation. Um, he's one of our favorite humans on the planet. And any anytime we get a chance to chat with him, we leave inspired, hopeful, gracious. And uh, tonight we'll we'll cover some pretty interesting topics for us personally. Like uh, I'm dealing with injury, so we'll talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. David just wrote an article for, uh, article for Trail Runner Mag Magazine, kind of dealing with a little bit of that, taking some time away from running and how that might impact if it does impact overall training and fitness. Uh, plus, we're going to answer as many of your questions as possible. Kim? Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Doing well. Uh, welcome, everyone. We have uh, several new names in the chat room tonight, so I just want to give a shout out and say hi to Nigel, Stephen, and Chris, all joining us for the first time tonight. So welcome. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, because we are live, and we will be bringing David on in just a second. If you have questions for Coach Roach, Ask them in the chat room. I've already pulled a few from our Discord server, which mm -hmm. is another perk of being a GR crew member. You can ask your questions ahead of time there. Mm -hmm. um, so very excited. Lots of great questions already. Tons of great questions. And again, because we're live, jump into the chat. Yeah. Kim's there. Um, we also like to start our show off by thanking uh, a, a huge portion of our community, our GR crew. Uh, if you would like to join the GR crew, all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as $2 a month to get to basically help everything that we do here, keep the lights on, the mics hot, but also get some really amazing perks on the back end. At that $5 per month level, we are doing daily live streams. So we've been going live now for almost a year. We're actually coming up on our one year anniversary of going day, uh, going live every single day, uh, talking about running, training, uh, life in general. We've covered a whole vast array of topics. So a huge shout out to our GR crew for helping just make this possible. Two individuals in particular at that top tier uh, really just go above and beyond. Rick Bjarnason is an ultra runner out of BC, uh, British Columbia, Canada, and his company, CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca, are a web design company, a web maintenance company. They did the GingerRunner.com website. Um, so huge shout out to Rick. He's he's an awesome human, and uh, we look forward to 
talking with him every month. And also Brian Sands, who's been a longtime supporter, and many of you know the name. Uh, he's incredibly inspiring. Ran his first marathon at the age of 55, uh, first ultra, first 100 miler, currently training for even bigger events beyond 200 miles. Brian is just one of the most lovable humans out there and uh, incredibly, incredibly kind and generous. So shout out to those two individuals. Thank you so much for helping us do what we do. Without further ado, it is always an honor and a privilege to welcome David Roach to the show. And what? I'm laughing because he said do a lot. He said, do, do what we do without further ado. Do what we do what we do. I'm also a child, so it just made <laughs> me laugh. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to introduce him here in just a second. If you can't hear David, let us know in the yes. chat. Just because, again, I'm kind of working through everything. I was surprised that you couldn't hear music at the beginning. You know, all this stuff. So we're we're, we're tweaking it and working through it and figuring it all out. Uh, without further ado, our wonderful guest, Coach David Roach. Hi! Yay. Thanks so much for having me on. This is wild. In this new mixed streaming <laughs> universe, I am seeing what the users are seeing, what the viewers are seeing, and it's a little bit overwhelming. I got to be honest. I might be... Uh, I might be turning turning this window slightly away from my face for a second. Um, perhaps I should have shaved that nose hair before I came on. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for having me. I am just like honored every single time I get to be on. I love the community. And, uh, you know, before you said you were comparing me to Ted Lasso, which is by far the best compliment I've ever received. And I can just like go out on that. That's, that for me is like the mic drop comparison of life. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's not wrong. It's like we are so thankful to have you in our life because you are our own personal Ted Lasso. Uh, what I I want to make sure that I emphasize that you were Ted Lasso before Ted Lasso was Ted Lasso. Yes. Oh, I think that means I deserve royalties. I, I would imagine. say that's at least what you deserve. Do you know a lawyer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know a good lawyer. I know a very... Uh, a lawyer that isn't too great with paperwork, um, and that's about it. Is his name Mavid Doach? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the lawyer's not too creative with fake names either. Um, but for the for the listeners that if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, you have to do it. Like um, the hype is there for a reason. It, I think I've seen it change more people's outlook on the world and give them permission to be enthusiastic or be loving or be forgiving. Or, you know, view this like ultimate complexity of the world and come out of that with just this almost like simple love um, than any other show um, that's on the Internet or on the in the world. So, yeah, watch Ted Lasso has lots of great quotes. My favorite one is like, do you believe in ghosts, Ted? And, and Ted Lasso <laughs> responds, yes. But more importantly, I believe ghosts need to believe in themselves, <laughs> um, which I think is more my vibe than, than anything, maybe. As we have sort of entered into this new year and, and sort of began to find routine and schedule and everything like that, because, you know, we've had you on the show uh, a number of times over the last year and had great conversations in regards to all sorts of, of training related questions, uh, injury related questions, just life in general related context. And you provided us with this wonderful blanket always of information, hope, and, and, and inspiration that we can basically nestle in as we get into this new year. Really one <laughs> wonderful sentence there. I'm trying to pull I know. my own I Ted Lasso. I held it together. I tried to. Barely, barely. You want to nestle in David's blanket? <laughs> of, of words and inspiration. No, no, no. Okay. Kim, he was saying, I am the blanket on God. which he nestles. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's also, you know, going to be the tagline for SWAT from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Your personal nestling blankets, Megan, Addie, and I. So much gold coming out of the show already. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, we're a handful of minutes into it, and we're all, yeah, this is already number one podcast uh, on <laughs> Apple Podcasts. Um, what I'm curious about is, has there been a change in what you've seen with athletes in regards to how they approach training, racing, overall outlook has there been a general movement towards positivity and uh, uh seeing the light at the end of the tunnel you know we're not out of the pandemic but you've been dealing with so many clients that have probably dealt with training during it have you seen the mentality or the focus shift a bit 
Heck no. Um, I mean, I would say maybe if we're just viewing it like through the myopic lens of running only, then there has been like a slight shift where some people are having races and other things to look forward to. Um, but I mean, what this might exemplify more than anything is that we're just all taking whatever we brought into this event, into this event, like, you know, the COVID uh, period and after. Um, and so I think what that's leading a lot of people to examine based on what I'm seeing is that, you know, it's not just going to get better. And, and that doesn't just mean like society isn't just going to open up. Even when it opens up, we're still going to be facing, you know, the the negativity in the world, the people telling us we're not enough, um, the running injuries, all this other stuff that isn't just a light switch that's going to turn turn back on. So, you know, I think in a lot of ways, the COVID time was this great, you know, reset where the lights did turn off a little. It sucked in so many ways. But the flip side of that is not everything becoming normal because what, whatever emotional state we we found ourselves in in this time is also going to distribute through to the future. So, you know, that's a long way of saying that what Megan and I have seen is that people are going through tough times right now. You know, a lot of people are struggling in in different ways. Sometimes that's related to running in that, you know, they're starting to see this light, light at the end of the tunnel with, with COVID and they're still not motivated and what's mm. up with that. Um, and sometimes it's just with life where it's like, I don't know, I want to go back to the way things were because the way things were, weren't necess wasn't necessarily making me happy either. Mm. Um, and so what, what arises from that? where it's not just darkness or light, it's all just kind of this, you know, this nice twilight. And so my the, the message there is like, you know, we just got to try to enjoy that process of it so much because the uncertainty that COVID brought out, um, I think a lot of people are reckoning with the fact that that uncertainty is always there and will always be there. Mm. Um, it's just sometimes it's more present than others, more obvious than others. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I hope that a lot of people are feeling that excitement and joy for the future, but at the same time, it's not easy right now. Um, I think that a lot of things are conspiring to make this moment in, in history full of all this like wonderful mix of interesting and cool and potential, and also this you know terrible mix of like self-loathing and self-judgment and questioning life decisions um, and the cool thing is that's where life happens. Um, the uncool thing is life is uncertain and we're going to have to figure it out as we go. So we're figuring it out as we go. And it's, it's a really interesting time to be a coach, to be an athlete, to be a person. Yeah. I'm actually really happy to hear you say that. Cause I think, I think it's probably pretty easy to kind of layer platitudes on things and say like, yeah, everything is there is this optimism and everyone is getting better and getting back to normalcy or f at least feeling that. But the reality is, I think that's putting uh, a layer of icing on, you know, sort of a shit cake in that there are so many things that are still <laughs> happening. I'm trying. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> um, but there's just there's so many things that everyone is dealing with in different capacities. And uh, they're even able to deal with in different capacities that I, I think by glossing over a lot of that we do ourselves a disservice um, yeah yeah well you know i would say to people listening like try to find happiness and like this is a great time to do it a lot of the external constraints are starting to get lifted but it's still an internal journey and if you are struggling it is okay and there are so many people with you i am coaching a lot of people that are telling me about their struggles and i am not seeing it on the social medias so like if you're using social media as a barometer it might not always be the most accurate one which is totally yeah. okay from their perspective like there's i don't even know if it's a healthy thing to process things on social media but i think a lot of the times we can assume that what we're seeing is even a remote ac remotely accurate reflection of emotional state and that's just not the way it's set up so you know people are struggling right now people are also really happy but you know if you're if you're on that like downslope know that there's going to be an amazing future ahead independent of whatever happens with masks and covid and all that that like we can all that we're all chasing um and not to try not to compare too much to how you think others might be experiencing the same thing i sort of want to uh bridge that topic with kind of the highlighted topic that i wanted to touch on today before we get to some of the viewer questions um you've already pulled a bunch of questions aside do we want to get to any of those now you were you seem like you were on I was a, on a I was on a bridge. 
yeah. walking from one yeah. side of town to other. Um, get, get there first. I'll get there. <laughs> you wrote this fantastic article, Trail Runner Magazine, in regards to you know, if, uh, having to take time off and does it change you as an athlete? Does it, does it make you, um, less trained or, you know, maybe it's not as less trained as you think as someone who is currently going through injury. And I've talked about this the last couple of weeks. I talked about it last Monday, uh, talked a lot about it on daily brew. I've sort of been documenting my daily struggles with, uh, what I thought was a very simple injury, calf injury, and having to sort of struggle to get my way back. And, the article couldn't have been better timed because the biggest issue that I've had to deal with mentally has been, I, I I was so ready to tackle this new year, new projects, you know, trying to find a little bit of light and, and racing and, and that sort of thing. And the immediate setback of an injury has sort of taken the toll on me mentally. And, and the journey has not been straight. Like it hasn't been a, I got injured. Damn. I got to take time off. Uh, let's start working on it. And then we're back. Um, help David, because <laughs> I know that my journey is not unique in that. I think a lot of people have the same sort of up, down, up, down, up, down when it comes to injury and coming back and taking time away from the sport. What sort of insight can you provide here that can give some of our viewers and listeners uh, a little bit of insight into injury coming back, that sort of thing. Well, first, Ethan, with the article today that came out today, you are my muse. You are my rose in the Titanic <laughs> getting painted. Um, no, I, I think, you know, injury is emblematic of this. It's absolutely inevitable in a running life. Um, those types of setbacks are fully uncontrollable. It's nothing you did wrong. It's nothing anyone did wrong when they have those setbacks. But it also zooms out to, you know, a lot of people in the pandemic had issues with with training, whether it's consistency or training at all. Um, and sometimes it goes way beyond that. I mean, you know, one thing that Megan and I have been talking a lot about recently is we've we've been fortunate enough to coach a lot of athletes that go through pregnancy. And mm. we've coached a few athletes that aren't able to run at all in their entire pregnancy um, after like a few weeks, you know, and then other athletes that are able to experience it in a fully different way. And it just gets back to the point that all of these things that that athletes are experiencing, all these layoffs, it's just the the natural flow of an athletic <clears throat> life. And what the point of the article was today is that the science of adaptation indicates that those setbacks are not a big deal. Fitness is much closer than it feels like. And way more than that, it's not just a downtime where you get back to where you were. Hmm. A lot of the science seems to indicate that you might have way more potential after that downtime than you had before it. Um, so the, to stay right at the start with fitness is always much closer than you think. So when you're talking about long-term adaptations, they're all on a much longer time horizon than our brains uh, like might conceptualize them. So, you know, there, a recent study actually um, that just came out in 2021 in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research looked at fitness maintenance and okay. found that Athletes that were training six times a week, if you cut them down to two times a week and just maintained a little bit of intensity, um, they were able to maintain almost all of their training adaptations in that time. Uh, and that also applies to strength work. Just one time a week of strength work can maintain all, adapta all, adapta all adaptations. So, you know, if you're at a place of like, oh, I haven't done much, you're fine. It's all right there, even if you might not feel like it is right now. Um, but if you've taken a lot more time off and started to detrain, all of the science there shows the same type of principles where, you know, your VO2 max might start to decrease. Um, your blood volume and your cardiac stroke output will both start to decrease. Um, but all of those come back very rapidly when training is reintroduced. You could take a year off and within, you know, three to six weeks, be back at your baseline with those variables. Wow. Um, and, and that's stunning because those are the cardiac, the, the aerobic variables that really start to count. Um, then the other one is like neuromuscular biomechanical lag. And this is probably the toughest one on a lot of people. It's like, even if you've been cross training, you start to just feel like, you know, real crap when you return. Um, and the point there is that a lot of those adaptations are, are starting in the nervous system. Um, and nervous system adaptations can happen really rapidly when you have a past stimulus. So, you know, what I see is that athletes can have this really extended down periods. And if they build back in a, in a consistent way, we're always within a month or two of where we were, of our peaks, or at least like approaching our peaks, approaching the place where we can train for that. So what feels so distant is actually right there. You just have to be patient and understand that, you know, 
feeling like a like a hippo with asthma is an okay part of the process that isn't indicative of like long-term loss. It's so much easier to get back where you were than it was to get there the first time. And this is what was so interesting <clears throat> to me is because it, it, my brain is telling me in the midst of an injury, and this isn't my first injury. Uh, I had an injury last year, made a video about it. I have a, I've had injuries in the past, uh, which I've talked about in the channel and, and multiple times before, but it, it's the mindset that is consistent with each one is you know, the more days you take off, the more you fear of losing fitness or not being in the place you were when you when you got injured. But hearing you say this and 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 the studies and everything is again, it's a constant reminder that I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of because I think it's easy to forget that and it's easy to let your mind waver and go, no, 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 well, this one's different, right? That's just the start of it. So I left off the the big thesis that I have and that I think every single coach worth a damn would back up too. It's that these breaks are not just chances to build back to where you were. They are an opportunities for breakthroughs. Um, so there's a few theories for why that might be. The one is more the basic long-term recovery that you can imagine conceptually, mm. um, that when we're talking about training, it's the process of introducing acute stresses to the body. So that might be a workout. It might be a long run. It might just be, you know, the, the normal nature of your daily run. Those acute stresses are great. Let's talk about a normal workout. Um, after that, you might have some muscle damage, some muscular fatigue. If you measured an athlete's creatine kinase levels right after a workout, you would see very elevated numbers that might even like cause it to ding on a, on a blood panel. Um, that's fine. That's part of adaptation. And an athlete will usually feel better in a couple of days, be ready for their next workout or be ready for their next um, more serious run. Um, but if we actually measured them like, at the cellular level and measured that creatine kinase again, we'd probably see levels that are still relatively elevated. And that's how acute stress can become chronic stress. It's that you start to stack these long tails of recovery on top of each other over time. Um, and everything works that way. And so, you know, when you're taking the time off, that's a chance to wipe that stress slate clean. Um, but the much cooler hypotheses that I really love are related to um, the endocrine and nervous systems. Um, perhaps the best one being um, the nervous system, because we don't really understand the nervous system because it's almost impossible to isolate and measure, especially for athletes. There's no real way to do it in a study. Can't do a brain biopsy. Um, and the, the basic principle there, if you think about overtraining syndrome, let's say, which is like a severe thing that we're not, is not specifically applicable, but generally applicable. Um, those athletes that have this, you know, this cellular level crap storm of overtraining syndrome cannot run through it. They can't just be like, okay, I'm going to maintain my fitness through overtraining syndrome. Almost always they need to fully rest, reset, sleep, eat, do all that stuff. So what are we actually seeing there? We're seeing that the nervous system has some underlying mechanisms that don't work by typical recovery rules. They're operating on much longer time horizons. Um, endocrine system works the same way. You can see that in amenorrhea for female athletes, for example. Um, so these long resets also give those systems a chance to, to fully um, rebuild. And it can be even more complicated things like protein expression or how your mitochondria develop. Um, all of these other uh, elements that add up to say, when you look at elite athletes, um, and I'm just looking at elite athletes because it's availability bias, and they're the ones I think of that are really pushing their true limits, sure. almost all of them can trace it directly back to a time they had to take an extended period off. And so if you're out there and you've had to take time off, whether it's for an injury, whether you're cross training or not, it's a huge opportunity to reset and get off that just stagnation, slow progress train. Because when you come back, you might find that, oh crap, I'm capable of so much more. And it took that time off to reach it. I, man, this is fantastic. It, 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 it's a deeper look into something that I think I've always questioned and I've always wanted to know more about that. I think I've talked to you in the past about it and, and just sort of try to get general knowledge of like, yeah, you need to take time away and what does it actually do to your system? In this case, I want to talk specifically about like doing big endurance events and taking recovery periods after those, because I think you, you talk about the, uh, in, oh my God, in, endo, endocrine system, endocrine system, endocrine, endocrine system, blankets, nestling. <laughs> and I, he, I see That's the word in my head and I know how it's spelled. And so then I just want to mispronounce it, even though you just said it 20 times in my face, uh, <laughs> endocrine system. Uh, when you talk about that, that's something that I feel like was underestimated by me after, for example, Cascade Crest 100, because, you know, I, I completed that and went, okay, I'm going to take that regular period of 
rest after this event. I built up to it, take my month off, get back to running. And I had a, an event maybe a month after that. It was like two months after two months after your race. Yeah. I had the New York marathon or something like that. But what I didn't know Mm -hmm. was that my body wasn't there. It wasn't Mm -hmm. ready. Uh, despite like having great runs and great training leading up to that second race, there was a whole other level that was at a different pace. It was at a different recovery pace. Is that sort of what you're talking about in regards to? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The, there are chronic stress processes that aren't just, you know, reserved for people that are doing wild training volume. In fact, I would say that those people might even be more naturally resistant to the pratfalls of chronic stress because they're partially chosen for that genetically. Um, otherwise they would not be doing what they were doing in the first place. Um, and though, so those processes, it's not just about recovery. Um, it's about like, yes, it can, it's possible to continue through them. Um, and I think a lot of people do for a really long period of time. And as they're doing that, they're just thinking that they're capable of so much less than they actually are. Um, because it doesn't feel often like, oh, I'm just tired all the time. It might just feel like, hey, I'm running. I'm just not improving as much as I hope. I feel fine. Um, And you don't know why. And I think a lot of athletes end up there. And that is probably related to some of these nervous system, endocrine system um, things and how they feed back into aerobic development over time. Um, We're not sure. But you can see it anecdotally and empirically in every single athlete that has like traversed a long career Mm. in a really happy and uplifting way with long-term progress. It's like these breaks are either are essential, either, you know, unwillingly via injury or willingly via, you know, break, uh, just breaks built in throughout a season. That's why we encourage every athlete we coach, no matter who the, who it is. I mean, it's one of our non-negotiable things that everyone is taking rest days, um, every single week. Um, that we're taking time off after every race, we try to incorporate our goal is for every athlete to have at least 10 weeks of a 52 week year off. Um, not all at once ever. We try to spread it out as much as possible. So like a week after a race, a day, a day, every week, that sort of thing. Um, or a week after every longer race. Um, but this is all because of those principles, because if we can unlock what the nervous and endocrine systems are capable of and how that feeds back into the neuromuscular system and biomechanics and all of that, then you see these athletes that just are accomplish unreal things. So as you're dealing with this injuries, as anyone is dealing with a setback, I just say like this break will make a breakthrough. It just requires a lot of self-compassion to get over the judgmental part of our brains that don't give a shit or give a crap about all of the, this physiology and much more don't want to feel like a wounded hippo on every single run at first. This immediately reminded me of don't call it a setback, call it a set up. Uh, just in regards, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the little nod. Tipping tip tip the tipping the tiny hat. hat. <laughs> um, because uh, again, I haven't just even. Uh, thank you for being on the show, David. Because I haven't felt this optimistic about what I'm going through right now for about a month and a half since I incurred the injury. I just haven't felt that positivity of maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Like maybe this is a set up. Um, I've told myself that, but I haven't felt it. Like, it's really easy for my brain to go, this is an injury. This happens. It happens to a lot of people, some of the best in the world, and they get through it. You know, people come back from these things. And, you know, it's one thing to tell yourself that. It's another thing to feel it. And I haven't felt it until just now, which is Well, and I think it's not necessarily about feeling it. I mean, it's kind of like talking about Ted Lasso. You know, we're talking about Ted Lasso, this guy that just believes in his enthusiasm. There's only one. Yeah. Well, (laughs) what I'm saying is that Ted Lasso or myself, it's not like these things are things we feel all the time. Like that's impossible. It's also would be a little bit gross and saccharine. Um, It's a choice that's constantly made based on an intellectual knowledge of the complexity of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Like I hope that my optimism and, and positivity comes, like everyone understands it comes from a place of being like, oh man, I'm dying sooner rather than later. And that kind of sucks. Right. Um, and, and that, and that sort of thing. Um, but like, you know, when you're talking about knowing this as, as an athlete with injury, um, the idea is just to keep reminding yourself, just be like, okay, this is fine. This isn't just fine. This might be an opportunity. This is something I can grow from. Um, and you're still going to be sad. You're still going to mourn about it. You're still going to wish you were running. You're still going to see runners on the street and hope to like push them into a sewer grate. 
Um, but in that process, it can give you just a little bit more permission not to get down on yourself. Mm -hmm. And those little steps are super key because as an athlete comes back, the adaptation process is heavily influenced by what they're thinking about what they're doing. Um, and this is a broader point that applies to everyone. It's that adaptation is just not, you introduce a stimulus, then you have an outcome later. It's you introduce a stimulus and then the body incorporates that through these complex webs of uh, interaction that we don't understand. But one thing that we do know plays a heavy role is how your your overall stress and uh, it's in other words, your thoughts about yourself um, interpret that signal. So, you know, an athlete that does judge the, the crap out of themselves all the time is going to end up at a totally lesser place than they they could. So belief isn't just like, bullshit that I talk about for the hell of it, belief is something that we talk about because it's what makes like your actual potential possible. Mm. I knew having David on was going to be a good <laughs> idea. I knew it. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to steal a lot of David's time. I know I could. Uh, I, we just love talking to David. So again, this is an ask David Roach episode ask coach roach so kim you pulled i mean there's a ton of questions there's a ton of questions and if you guys have more questions you can keep leaving them in the chat room there as well there's a lot of love for asthmatic hippos happening in the chat room right now also um gotta make a t-shirt out of that yes uh question from michael michael says david i've been going through an injury the last few months and i've been feeling like i don't belong in the community or like a runner anymore because i'm not running any advice Oh my gosh, nothing makes you more of a runner than being injured. <laughs> um, I think it's the one thing that unites basically every single athlete, but especially runners. Um, so the feeling, so one, you're a freaking runner. Anyone listening to this, if you even like one day dream of maybe going around the block, you are a freaking runner and, and accepting that is key. But as it relates to the community, that can be super tough. And this is where talking about, you know, the difficulties you're having can be super helpful because every single runner identifies with it on a deep level. Like even me, you know, as a coach, when Ethan tells his story, I'm not thinking about all the other athletes I coach that have gone through crap. I'm thinking of my own injuries, you know, and how sad that's made me and how disconnected that's made me mm. feel. Um, so, you know, the, in the process that involves one, giving your, cutting yourself a freak ton of freak ton, that should also be sure. um, <laughs> cutting yourself a lot of slack. That's, you know, just mm -hmm. accept those thoughts that you will have that are intrusive, even if you don't want to have them. Um, two, engaging with the community when you can, um, with the understanding that everyone will get it. Um, and three, embracing it and Embr embracing the fact that injury just means that you're putting yourself out there and giving yourself a chance. No one gets injured on a couch until they're like 60 and throw out their back going for the remote or something, you know, um, by getting off the couch, we're going to get injured. We're opening ourselves up to that. Be like, man, this is just a sign that I am a badass, and that's part of it. And that's, and it's not just part of it. That is an essential part of it. If I didn't ever get injured, it would just be a sign that I'm not pushing myself hard enough. Mm. A uh, question from Megan in the chat room. Megan says, Coach Roach, how do you overcome self-doubt in training and racing and even in career changes in life? You guys have taken leaps of faith that are so inspiring, but even thinking about the self-doubt or even the doubt of those around you scares the heck out of me to the point of paralysis. Love listening to you both, David and Megan, and their advice and inspiration, all the things. I'm signed up for my first half and my first COVID shot knocked me out of training and and the questioning of my ability is already kicking in. I know I can complete the race because I have 12 hours to do so, but I'm terrified that I won't meet my expectations. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. So first, is my sound okay? I forgot to ask because I'm trying a new setup here. Uh, is the sound okay? We haven't heard a thing. We haven't yet. heard a thing. We just re been reading <laughs> lips. We're professionals. Oh, perfect. So, Honestly, I think that that is the least amount of bullshit I've ever said on one of these episodes. So. <laughs> Works well. Um, great. So, you know, those thoughts that you are having, one, you're a beautiful writer. The way you described that gave me chills. Um, two, those thoughts you are having are 100% ubiquitous outside of people with diagnosable personality disorders. Um, you know, the self-doubts we have are just a rational way of looking at this uncertainty I talked about at the beginning of the episode and applying that to the future. If you have any awareness of like, 
this swirl of like cosmic entropy, you're going to be like, oh, wait, so everything I'm hoping and dreaming is totally hanging by a thread if I really think hard enough. Um, and that's also where the power can come from. That is where the liberation comes from, is this understanding that, okay, nothing is predestined. We're all just, you know, monkeys playing poker while we're here. Why not take shots? You shoot a shot not because it's going in. You shoot a shot because it's the best way to live with the time that you are given. Um, so, you know, what that means for different people can vary a ton. And I know it's a privileged place to say, you know, shoot a shot at all. But like, I always like thinking about, you know, Steph Curry or someone in the NBA who just comes down and launches it from 35 feet, not because he thinks it's going in every single time, but because it's, that's what he does. That's like Steph Curry. Um, and, you know, so find out like what the type of day you want to live it, lead is like, mm -hmm. And just start making decisions that point in that direction. You're going to swerve from your current path. And that doesn't mean then you're on a straight line. It means you're just finding where the next swerve is. So you swerve, you swerve, you swerve, not ever sure where you're going. And if you make those decisions from, okay, what is the type of life I want to lead and the type of person I want to be? Eventually, you'll probably find that I could never have predicted where I was when I took that first swerve. But damn, that first swerve, that courageous one off into the unknown was so important because without it, I never would have gotten the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, and as you're doing that process, the next step is really just like this constant focus on self-compassion, um, you know, because part of the deal with uncertainty is that there are no right answers. We're constantly going to be screwing up, effing up in all these big and little ways. It's being human. Um, that'll include these big life swerves. That'll include your running. That'll include the type of partner you are, if that's a thing in your life, or the type of parent you are. Um, and understanding that when you screw up or when things hurt or, or all these other elements, that you're still freaking awesome and it's okay and you're going to get through it. And tomorrow's going to be better than today was on the bad days. Um, and on the good days, tomorrow might be worse, but you're going to have a good day after that. Um, and so once you get that those processes feeding back, it really can give you this like liberated courage that, yeah, I'm going for it, but I'm going for it in a low stakes setting because I'm freaking awesome whether it works out or not. Um, and then you start launching threes from 35 feet and just find that, damn, I'm hitting threes from 35 feet. I am the Steph Curry now. Um, and that can happen whether you achieve your wildest dreams or not, because the wildest dreams, like achieving them is not the point. The point is to dream them in the first place. Dropping threes. Threes and threes <laughs> and threes. threes. Uh, um, I have to say that there's so much love in the chat room tonight for having David on. There's a lot of folks who are seemingly saying that that having David on tonight was the perfect timing for them, that they needed this today. Mm -hmm. um, I love hearing that. And that's why we love having David on. A hundred percent. And uh, Vivian puts it better than I think I have tonight. Uh, talk I, about blankets, bridges. Well, no, I, I mentioned <laughs> blankets and bridges, but Vivian refers to it as a balm for the emotional self-doubt I had going on the last couple of weeks. A balm. Yeah. David, I hope you don't mind being compared to a balm. A balm, not a bomb. Not No, a balm <laughs> with an L. It is. I, I don't know. I feel like I have reached a certain <laughs> goo-like consistency during the pandemic. So uh, a balm seems appropriate. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, all of these messages are just designed to say, like, we will always be able to find things that we don't love about ourselves. Um, and those things do not end. Um, there is no end point where that shit gets better. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not constantly refocusing on like what makes you this amazing bundle of stardust you are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the flip side of striving of, you know, wanting to be a better athlete, wanting to be a better person, wanting to be a better parent, all of that stuff is that there's a, a slight amount of that that implies that, wait, am I not enough now? Mm -hmm. um, and so to that question, I say, hell yes, you are enough now. And we're striving for improvement, not to actually improve. I mean, that would be great. Um, but because it's such a fun way to get to like, you know, experience existence and like fully put yourself out there and be vulnerable and learn and find where that next swerve is and all that other stuff. Like none of that stuff happens on the couch as much as I love myself some couch. Speaking of couch, there's an Addy sighting behind you. Oh, yeah. Little head popped up, little back, little uh, black and white fur. So cute. Addy. Hey. 
<laughs> I, I didn't cut to us because it would cover where Addie is. Okay. Oh. Maybe one or two more questions while we have David. Yeah. A question from Deb in the chat room. Deb says, David, what do you tell your athletes who are dealing with guilt of missing a workout? Oh, gosh. No workout matters. I mean, these are little bricks in a great wall of China here, like I, or the biggest wall you can imagine. Um, and so, you know, one brick out of that, not a big deal whatsoever. Um, every day is just a new chance to recommit to whatever you're doing. So when I think even in, in like, let's say a top professional athlete that has this training plan that's designed eight weeks out and, and dialed into like the 10th of a mile type stuff, it's like, ah, screw that. Like, you know, day off, three days off, week off, all that stuff just smooths out over time. As long as we're committed to this general goal of like, growth and self-belief and investing in, you know, yourself and what you're capable of the singular days, singular weeks, months. I mean, it all ends up being dust in, in the wind of like someone's long-term progress. So, um, yeah, I would just say that gets back to the cutting yourself slack thing. Like you're each day is an opportunity. Try to have fun, try to enjoy it, try to, you know, do what you can as an athlete. Um, but if it doesn't work out, What's way more important is that you process that emotionally in a place of self-love so then you can adapt to future stimuli in a productive way rather than burying yourself in these like cortisol cycles that end up decreasing what you can actually get from future work to anyway. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, a, a day off, a missed workout, gosh, that's just bonus adaptation. I mean, I write that all the time. Bonus adaptation. <laughs> uh, so I'll take it. Another t-shirt. 17 t-shirts we're going to make uh, <laughs> uh, on tonight's show. Um yeah, maybe a couple more. Yeah, this question's from Elwood. It's more of a specific uh, training question for Elwood. Elwood asks, Coach Roach, when running a 100-mile race, would there be a massive difference in fatigue points if you're running at a comfortable pace versus starting very slow? Uh, Elwood goes on to say, my normal running pace would be six-minute kilometers, thinking of thinking do i start out at seven or eight-minute kilometers or do i stick with six or do six and mix in some walking? That is a terrific question, aside from the use of kilometers, which I am useless with and will not be doing the math. <laughs> no, I, I have a general feel. No, so that's a fantastic point about pacing in ultra events. So generally what we have seen is that when you're racing an ultra event, essentially you're playing a game of two major limiters. One is your glycogen availability, your ability not to bonk, to have fuel to to perform. Mm. Two is the musculoskeletal stress of longer events, particularly as it relates to downhills, but all longer events have eccentric muscle contractions as your muscles fatigue, which is when a muscle lengthens under load and can cause the jello legs feeling where you just have nothing left in your legs. Um, so we'll approach both of them on that question. The first, when we're talking about like glycogen sparing, glycogen depletion, once an athlete, the key thing to think about here is aerobic threshold. So that's where an athlete switches primarily from glycogen metabolism to primary li primarily lipid metabolism. Um, so under under aerobic threshold, you're burning mostly fat. Um, that's good. That's what you need to do to be able to go all day because you have fat reserves that last. You know, all of us, no matter who you are, um, you can burn lipid lipids all day. Um, so right at glycogen, right at the aerobic threshold, you're still burning a fair amount of glycogen. Um, and that's probably too fast for most athletes. So most likely your everyday pace is approaching your aerobic threshold. Um, so you'll probably want to back off a little bit from that, but you don't need to back off too much because once you start to get down, you know, 5% below that, 10% below that, um, you stop to, you stop, you know, being limited by that because you can replace it all with mid run fueling, you know, your, your burn rate will be lower than the amount of fuel you can take in it. 300 ish calories an hour. So a little bit below your everyday, um, aerobic pace, but it doesn't need to be that much below. You don't need to run scared, scared money. Don't make money. Um, so, you know, you gotta go all in with that. <laughs> You've been, um, I, I've heard though, you use that recently too. Relevant. And that's related to musculoskeletal stress of these events. Um, so most likely faster paces will have a little bit more, um, like impact, particularly on the downhills that can add up over time. So make sure in the context of your training, you're doing some harder downhills in your long runs that are harder than you'll ever go in the race and doing like some typical workouts every once in a while to, work, to go faster. If you're able to combine those two elements, then I think almost anyone can rock a 100 miler with consistent training, even without doing big volume or big long runs. Um, it really comes down then to a game of fueling versus pacing. So this question really nailed, I think, 
the limiting factor on a lot of people's 100s and shows that you're going to demolish yours. Scared money don't make money. Uh, you, Is that you, another t-shirt? It's another t-shirt, but uh, David used that a couple days ago today. I, I've heard you use it before and I was like, I haven't heard that in so long. <laughs> and I just love it. I just love it <laughs> because it applies. It totally applies to this. And I, I was kind of thinking through ultra races that I've done in the past where I start you start a little scared. You start a little slow. Like, I don't know how my body's going to react at mile 40. It's like, well, no one does when they start, you know, so why not? Why not have some fun? And you think about it, like if you're not aerobic, like glycogen limited at that point, if you're not bonking, then it just means that you're out there longer and that gives more time for muscle breakdown. So, you know, trying to finish as quickly as you can in the context of the constraints of, you know, your aerobic system is the way to go because, you know, it's harder to do 145 hours than it is to do 135 hours mm. by a ton. Um, you know, it, especially for the same athlete, but also other athletes. It's one, you know, it gets back to like, you know, I think sometimes people look at like professionals and are like, oh, that's so amazing. They push themselves so hard. It's so impressive. It's like, actually, I think objectively, if we're talking about what's going on with physiology, it's much harder to maybe be, you know, like chasing a cutoff or something. Um, and so I think it's an important point of like the respect in this community should not go necessarily to, you know, some professional that's a mistake of genetics or whatever. Um, it should go to the person that is perhaps chasing a cutoff or something. Um, or my dream of one day being able to train to the point where they possibly can chase a cutoff. That's where the magic happens of this sport. I think. I still remember that one of my, one of my favorite races that I've run, I, I DNF'd, but it was Wham! Not last year, but the year before. And you had gave me the advice of just go for it. Just go for like, go for it. Because I think I was super concerned with like, how am I going to hold up over time in this race? And and you were just like, just, you know, lay it all out there, have fun. Um, and I did. And I ended up, I mean, it was very hard. I think I DNF'd just after the 50K mark, but it was incredibly hard, but I also had so much fun. And the fact that I did end up DNFing, I also felt fulfilled because I was like, I did everything I could today mm. and I had fun. And I, I don't didn't have any regrets of feeling like, oh, I held back. I wish I would have this or wish I would have that. So, oh, yeah. yeah, shoot your damn shot. I mean, I this is something that predates coaching for me. It was more of an athletic thing. But I remember, you know, I was just like toiling away, training really hard, wanting to like succeed and all these other things. And I did a race and I only got to race like one or two national races a year. Mm. Um, this is like a decade ago. And so, and you know, I raced smart and had a bad race. Um, and remember thinking after that, it's like, um, smart is really overrated <laughs> because <laughs> even if I had done a good race that way, I still would have been left with questions and it still wouldn't have changed my happiness at all. Um, and so why not just put yourself out there? That doesn't mean like, be intentionally stupid. Um, it just means like, what's the, what is the highest I think I could do what I could achieve and don't view it through your own context, view it through like my context, like how, what I'm telling you or, you know, what Megan might tell me. And it's like, do that and see what happens. I did that. And, and it can lead to very different places at, um, you know, I remember at the world mountain champs in 2016, I did that. And I was one of the last place finishers. Um, I did that at way too cool in 2016. I had two minutes on the field at mile 1.5 and won the race, you know, and that's how life is too. Um, you know, it's all this random crapshoot. Sometimes it can really feel disorienting to be like, I want things to turn out a certain way. How do I make that happen? But, you know, the benefit of coaching is getting to see that often an outcome happens and then we justify it you know, ex post fast or whatever, like after the fact, we justify it based on what happened before. It's like, okay, well, all that stuff led to that. It's like, no, it's still just a crapshoot. Like, you know, I, I'll have athlete win a big race or something. And I'm asked about their training. It's like, they had a 10% chance of winning that race. They did win, but it doesn't just, it doesn't mean that the other 90% didn't exist and that I'm a brilliant person. Same thing goes for DNS. I'm not the worst coach in the world when that happens. Um, and it also applies to everything we do <laughs> that there's this, great swirl of uncertainty that we're facing all the time. And we want to be like, okay, how can I control that? This element of control. Um, and then things happen that show that we didn't have control, whether it's a pandemic or an injury 
or just the nature of life's up and downs. Um, and it's so hard. It's a, in central time to like grieve if it's a situation of loss, like an injury or, or God forbid, like, you know, family or, or other things that you can't control. But that's also the beauty of where life happens. And from those things, like, like with the injuries, often what grows back is the most beautiful, fulfilling, rich thing you could ever imagine. Mm. Um, and there's no way you could even project that if you were trying to control every little thing. So, you know, in the uncontrollable things, we're not seeing like destruction and things being torn down. I really think we're seeing the seeds being planted for all the beautiful growth to come. So I just want to say like, if you're going through tough things now, th there are seeds being planted. You might not be able to see them and it might not be much solace, but if you just give it time, you give it some water, you give it some self love, um, it's going to lead to the most beautiful places, you know, beyond what I think we could ever imagine. I think that's a perfect place to wrap up today's main show as the mm -hmm. beautiful sunlight basks on David's <laughs> face, uh, <laughs> the light from the heavens above. Um, our guest tonight, David Roach, never fails to deliver when it comes to a, a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of hope, a little bit of guidance uh, he is again, uh, one of the best coaches that we know. We're very fortunate to get a chance to work with him and Megan. Uh, they're a fantastic duo that coach some of the best athletes and athletes of all abilities across the world. Uh, so David, thank you so much for joining us and answering viewers questions and just being such a, again, wonderful, wonderful guest. Um, I do of course want to turn the tables over to you here as we wrap up the main show before we move into the after show. And where can people find you? I mean, some work, I'll play podcast, the book. Uh, what can people do to support you, follow you, and all that good stuff? Let us know. Uh, listen and subscribe to the Some Work, I'll Play podcast. I actually have something now. Um, and then, like, my little 10-second parting message is just, like, I love you all. That's an awkward thing to say. Um, it might even make some people cringe. Um, but the idea of love that we're talking about here is just like the thing that holds everything together, whatever that undefinable is, is. Um, and so we're all experiencing that, even people that hate me or disagree with me. Um, and it can really be a lot, it can be heavy, but it also gives you this opportunity to experience and share with others. So if you can tell people that you love them, um, not just people that you tell all the time, but spread that out just like a little bit, just a little farther in your social circle, if you can. Um, might not do anything, or it might make a really big difference. Um, and either way, it's an interesting experiment you can tell me about next time I'm on. We are, again, incredibly thankful to have someone like David in our lives and and all of us get David in our lives. We're, we're thankful to have him on a show like this where you know our viewers can come and watch and listen and interact with him. Um, but again, you know, follow them on social media, check out swap, uh, some work, all play podcasts. It's available across podcast networks, wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Uh, he and Megan just have such a great rapport and communication style. Uh, imagine this podcast in a shortened version, but like hyper attack of amazing positivity. It is, it is great. It is like a balm for the emotional so it's it's great and with a little bit of running thrown in and some uh athletic stuff just like that so our guest tonight david roach we're just so thankful to have him in our lives and thankful for him to be on the show tonight uh a huge thank you to all of our crew um we just we're so thankful to have such an amazing community here a nice little tip of the hat to the guardians of the crew as well uh the blue wrenches tonight absolutely uh thankful to have them here we always like to wrap up our shows, though, by recognizing members of this community who go above and beyond, who are amazing. They are our GR. Where's my mouse? There it is. Uh, they your are mouse? my mouse. <laughs> balm. <laughs> they are our GR crew members of the week. Kim, who is this week's GR crew member of the week? This week's GR crew member of the week is Tim Sim. And Tim uh, wrote in our shoot your shot channel on discord the other day that uh tim was running a the uh pearl and 10k and tim had three goals number one was break my 10k pb of 140 43 which tim set during grgr 2020 nice two 
was run a sub one hour, 45 minute, 10 K and three was if unable to reach the other two goals above, just finish the 10 K before the cutoff. And I am happy to report that Tim set a new 10 K PR. So Tim set a new 10 K PR of 137.37, crushing all three goals. Fantastic, Tim. Congratulations to you for being our GR crew member of the week. We love recognizing amazing accomplishments like that. Uh, a huge thank you again to everyone who tuned in tonight, watched live, enjoyed tonight's show with David. Uh, if you would like to join us for our after show, we're going to move right over there with David. We're going to ask any residual questions that we had during the main show and then rapid fire through a couple additional more. Uh, you can join our after shows. It's very easy to do. Just go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as $2 a month. You get access to all of our after shows or $5 a month. You get access to our daily live streams. And then there's tiers uh, from there that add even more amazing perks. So we are so thankful to have GR crew. They help us do what we do that is it everyone we hope you get out there train hard race harder and party the hardest i know i am we'll see you guys next week for more fun good night thanks all Ginger.